I'm Nikki Jovicki from Lookup Strata, and I'm also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate, and today I'm your host. Thank you for joining us for this important discussion on the intersection of disability rights and body corporate legislation. Our communities are becoming increasingly diverse, and it's crucial our living spaces reflect this. With an ageing population and a heightened awareness of accessibility, body corporates are facing new challenges in ensuring their buildings are inclusive and welcoming to all residents. We understand navigating the complex interplay between disability rights and body corporate legislation can be overwhelming. So today we're fortunate to have Brendan Pittman from Grace Lawyers and Will Markin from Tower Body Corporate. Brendan's expertise in disability rights and discrimination law combined with Will's practical approach to body corporate management will offer insights into the legal framework and solutions for addressing accessibility challenges. We will look at the complexities of body corporate legislation and disability rights, explore the implications of the groundbreaking Knox case, address the challenges of maintaining accessible facilities in older buildings, and discuss issues related to emotional support animals and lift breakdowns. We believe this webinar will provide valuable information and practical guidance to help body corporates meet their obligation to provide accessible living spaces. For those who are joining us today from outside of Queensland, welcome. It's great to have you here, but we do remind you that this is a Queensland webinar, so any reference to legislation is Queensland-based and the information may not be applicable in your state. And before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information in the session, including discussions arising from submitted questions and chat conversations, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as advice, and you should always seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in the session. Uh, this morning, we welcome back Will Markand. Will joined the Tower Body Corporate team as General Manager and Senior Body Corporate Manager in 2020. A licensed strata manager, he has extensive experience in commercial, industrial and residential schemes. A former journalist and teacher, Will also regularly contributes to the Lookup Strata site as both a writer and a webinar presenter. He believes in proactive, ethical strata management and hopes to provide Tower's customers with the knowledge and support required to take your scheme into the next generation of body corporate management. And we also welcome Brendan Pittman, partner at Grace Lawyers. Brendan is a recognised strata litigation and dispute resolution practitioner across Australia, particularly Queensland. He represents bodies corporate and owners in mediations, appears in federal and state courts and tribunals, and engages in dispute resolution through the Commissioner's Office. Brendan provides practical solutions by strategically selecting the appropriate remedies to pursue, and Brendan is a member of Strata Community Association Queensland, Australian College of Strata Lawyers, and various strata legislative forums. He's based in the Gold Coast office and leads the Strata litigation team at Grace Lawyers. So thank you so much, Will and Brendan, for joining us for today's very important session. I want to start by um, identifying what the trends are that make this topic um, of growing interest. Um, first, we have an ageing population um, and with housing concerns, the density in which people need to live is increasing. Um, this is naturally creating a, a mix of various occupiers with varying um, interests and capabilities. And so we're seeing um, the interaction between people with impairments or different needs and um, current buildings um, that are um, growing and needs this um, discrimination law um, to work um, well. Um, another trend we're seeing is um, buildings are only ever getting older. Um, and those buildings um, aren't all required to um, be constructed or maintain the current disability access standards. So we have a bit of a, a difference between the buildings and current legislation um, disability standards. Um, we also have what's quite general and used a bit in the industry is the duty to act reasonably. This scope as body corporate and committees need to make more and more decisions, the scope of this duty is really increasing and we'll see how it um, interplays with um, the discrimination laws in Queensland. With that said, um, the focus will be on the Anti-Discrimination Act in Queensland. This slide really gives a framework for how questions need to be answered um, with respect to um, a body corporate and whether something is um, discriminatory. Um, it needs to be an area covered by the Act. 
initially based on a particular attribute. A lot of these words are defined. Um, it needs to uh, constitute indirect discrimination or direct discrimination. And then the Act talks about exemptions. So I really want to, we're going to use this framework today to talk about a particular case um, that came out a few years ago and how this type of framework was applied um, to that case. So in 2020, we had um, Mrs. Knox, and she made an application to QCAT um, under the um, Queensland discrimination legislation. Set the scene, we have a high-rise building on the Gold Coast. Um, Mrs. Knox suffers a stroke. Um, this creates an impairment, um, and she relies on a wheelchair for mobility. She makes a complaint in 2013 about accessing parts of the common property because of this impairment as a result of her stroke. She made a complaint to the Human Rights Commission in 2016. Um, you can already see how this has been going on for many, many years. Um, 2017, the body corporate um, obtained a report about the common property how would someone with impaired, impaired movement access parts of the common property? Um, in 2019, so some six years um, later, um, the body corporate resolved some motions at general meeting, um, but importantly, they didn't resolve to approve expenditure for a pool hoist. Um, shortly after this meeting, then the complaint is made to QCAT. There were five key issues in the um, proceeding in QCAT. Um, as we look at these five contentions, as they were called, you might be thinking about your own schemes and how some of these may apply to your scheme. So first, um, couldn't access the street frontage because of stairs. Think about your own schemes, are there ramps? Um, is there access from the foyer, from the lift? Are there stairs? Is there a basement driveway? How steep is it? Um, another was accessing the foyer floor. Um, the pool area, um, is it a hinge door? Does it have a swipe access card? Um, does it have the little pop top at the top of a pool gate? Um, the basement car park, um, are the ramps or pathways quite tight? Here, the wheelchair was catching on the corner of a ramp, which was making access quite difficult. Um, and the swimming pool. Um, we have um, beach access swimming pools where there's a gradual slope. This one had stairs. Um, how are people accessing the pool? Um, most people might take these things for granted, but if you have an impairment to your movement or some other attribute that makes access difficult, um, these were the challenges um, that Mrs. Knox said she was facing. So I think first it wouldn't be a body corporate webinar without um, turning to our trusted um, duty to act reasonably. Um, it's quite a broad duty, but it requires uh, body corporate to act reasonably when they're doing or not doing things about the common property. Um, importantly for today, um, that duty to act reasonably um, includes the making of improvements to common property that might be needed in order to assist someone with an impairment or another disability um, to access parts of common property and the services that are offered um, by a body corporate. Um, while, while today we're talking a lot about QCAT and about um, avenues under the um, Anti-Discrimination Act Queensland, um, there are other avenues as well. And I've just put their application to Commissioner's Office. Um, just because we're talking about QCAT today doesn't mean that if someone has submitted a motion um, to a committee or at general meeting and they feel they haven't got the result that they want or they feel that um, the committee or body corporate have acted unreasonably in making a decision. There's always the avenue to apply to the commissioner's office for a um, resolution of the dispute based on whether it was um, the decision was made reasonably or not. Um, so first in the framework, 
um, the act has to apply to a body corporate in order for us to get into the nitty gritty of the Discrimination Act. It only applies if it's in an area covered by the act. Now the two common, there's a range of areas defined in the legislation. The two common ones that would apply and did in the Knox case to a body corporate was what's called the accommodation area um, and also um, services. So it wasn't contentious that the body corporate provides accommodation. Obviously, people live there, there's residents, um, and that's their, their home. Um, and so the body corporate um, was relevantly had accommodation areas. Services was um, dealt with a bit more in detail, but um, ultimately the tribunal determined that um, there are services, there's um, pools, there's tennis courts, there's um, maybe a gymnasium, there's lots of areas of common property that provide services or benefits to those residents. Um, and ultimately, therefore, um, the Discrimination, Discrimination Act um, will apply to a body corporate. Um, so if it is covered by an area, which um, it likely will be with a body corporate, um, it the discrimination has to be based on an attribute. Now, the list I have on the slide is very broad, um, so people appreciate it's pretty, pretty easy, pretty hard to get away from one of the attributes listed in the Act. I've underlined at the bottom of the first column, impairment. Um, it is separately defined in the legislation, and it's defined really broadly. So um, you have to be quite inventive um, to think of an attribute that isn't covered um, by this um, piece of legislation. Now, this is probably where it starts getting a bit more, um, a bit more tricky because there needs to be some adjustment or some um, way that someone is required to access parts of common property. And it's trying to determine what this term is. Um, it's defined as a condition requirement or practice, doesn't have to be in writing. Um, and it's really in order for Brendan, in order for insert resident to access a particular service or access a part of common property, what do they need to do? Um, so some of the examples of that in the Knox case was um, she was, Mrs. Knox was required to um, navigate stairways and use a hydraulic door with a fault in order to access parts of common property. Um, she was also required to swipe a fob and pull a door towards her while using a wheelchair. And so if you think about what do I need to do to access this common property? Think about the various steps you need to do. That will be the term that will be imposed on someone. It sounds all a bit dry, um, but it's actually really important, this, this part of the inquiry, because until you've determined what this term is, it's difficult to determine whether it's discriminatory or not. Um, once you've sort of figured out, do you need to swipe access? Do you need a key? Do you need to pull a door? Do you need to go downstairs? Um, then you need to go to the question of, well, does that constitute discrimination? Now, I've focused on indirect discrimination because that's a little bit more nuanced. Direct discrimination is a bit more simple to identify. Um, so indirect discrimination is... Um, a person with that impairment or that, that attribute from that big long list, um, they're not able to comply with it. Most other people um, without the attribute can comply and the term is not reasonable. So that is the um, hierarchy that the tribunal went through in deciding the Knox case. That's a bit of the um, framework. Um, what actually happened in the Knox case? Um, the first four contentions um, were not unreasonable. So um, she wasn't able to comply with them. People without, most people without that attribute 
could comply, but then it came down to, well, was it unreasonable? Um, and tribunal said no. Um, it, that term, that way of accessing that comm property service is not unreasonable and therefore no relief was given to Mrs Knox based on the first four um, contentions. Where Mrs Knox was successful was, and this is not the exact pool um, in question, but I think it represents um, the issue being faced, is Contention five, which was her ability to access the pool, the term was she had to go down some stairs. Um, people with people who were not in a wheelchair um, could comply with that term. She couldn't comply with that term. Um, she needed some other way to access the pool. Um, and the question really came down to whether that was reasonable or not. Because it completely restricted her from using the pool, um, the alternative of a pool hoist, um, which was around $8,000 in that case, um, was relatively inexpensive. Um, it was determined that that was unreasonable and did constitute indirect discrimination. Um, as always in the law, there's exceptions and exceptions. Um, just because it is indirect discrimination, um, there can be a exemption under the act. And what that is, if there's unjustifiable hardship. So using a hypothetical example, if a pool hoist, for example, cost a million dollars, um, while it may be, um, it may constitute indirect discrimination, the balancing act of the tribunal is, would that impose an unjustifiable hardship on in this case, a body corporate, from installing it. Um, so if it does constitute unjustifiable hardship, then it's an exemption. And um, while there might be discrimination, um, the body corporate's not required to do anything about it. Um, here, because the pool hoist was relatively inexpensive, there were sufficient funds um, available to the body corporate. And as we know, in a body corporate, that cost, if you have something that's $8,000 and you have um, you know, 100 owners, then that's not much of a cost for each owner. Um, it's probably because of the nature of body corporate and there's lots of owners contributing to the cost of the body corporate, I expect it would be quite difficult to satisfy something's um, would impose unjustifiable hardship because of the ability a body corporate has to spread the load and spread the cost across so many people. Um, but the exemption didn't apply um, to that one. So it was indirect discrimination and not excused. Um, th there are some remedies um, that are available. Um, it's very broad. Um, it can be as simple as an apology, uh, compensation, um, can order that someone do something, i.e. install the pool, ho pool hoist and engage contractors, um, and can even involve um, a cost order. Um, in the Knox case, um, the tribunal awarded $5,000 payable by the body corporate to Mrs Knox. That was in um, acknowledgement of her inability to access the pool and a, a value as best the tribunal could quantify, a value put on that inconvenience and that um, inability to access a benefit. Um, and $5,000 was the number the tribunal came up with. Um, a private apology was ordered to be given um, and costs. I don't know the exact amount of the costs. It's not, um, it's not detailed um, in the case, but it, wouldn't have, it would not have been all of the costs um, of Mrs. Knox, but it would have been a portion um, of those costs. But that's an example of the types of orders um, that the tribunal um, can make. I think um, there's, there's a couple of really important takeaways, um, particularly for those viewers who um, may be managing a um, body corporate complex or those on a committee. Um, there was a sort of at least six year history um, outlined in the case. And it's important to be proactive. Um, that's not saying everyone needs tomorrow to go and put 
um, handrails and um, ramps and non-slip matting and do everything um, possible. But it, it it's a good it's a good way to start by going. What are my risk areas? What are some areas in com property that um, might be difficult for someone to access? Um, and this is probably best done by an independent report writer. Um, there are providers of disability audit reports um, that can go through your complex, um, think about workplace laws and the like, what would be difficult to access, and then provide that to a committee. So at least they can sort of start to understand and think about, well, this might be a, a few thousand dollar improvement. This might be a $10,000 improvement. They can start to potentially budget for these types of expenses. Um, I think a really important takeaway from the case as well is just because your building complex was built to code or built up to standard doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, uh, it complies with the disability standards. They are um, in the same swimming pool, but different swimming lanes. And so um, you know, we need to also think about, well, um, what it was someone that does have an impairment um, or an attribute that prevents them from accessing um, parts of common property. Um, is there some disability to standard that we need to be meeting? Um, I think another really interesting one, you might've noticed that the general meeting approved improvements, but didn't approve um, the cost for the pool hoist. Um, and the committee naturally had to abide by that decision. Um, even though it was the majority of owners made this decision, it wasn't one person, um, the body corporate still had the liability to pay for some compensation. And so I think what's important, particularly those who manage complexes and are submitting motions, it's important to tell owners what the risks are or the legal exposure to the outcome of general meeting motions. So if I'm an owner and I see something and my mind just thinks of um, how can I spend the least amount of money, I might vote no to something. But if I'm informed that if I vote no and the other majority owners vote no and there's a possible risk that um, someone might make an application under the Anti-Discrimination Act um, and you know, there might be uh, prospects of success and then we might have to be engage in a dispute, I might vote a bit differently. And so I think having explanatory notes um, to particularly motions of a sensitive nature, um, such as these types of ones, are a really good practical way for um, committees um, and people submitting motions um, to help others to understand why um, an expense needs to be incurred. Have there been subsequent cases that have supported the findings in the Knox case? Not that I'm aware of, Will. Um, there may, may be in other uh, jurisdictions, um, but the Knox case, as far as I'm aware, is the um, current case, um, particularly pertaining to a body corporate um, under the Anti-Discrimination Act Queensland. So that's that's the best case at the moment that I'm aware of. And that was obviously a very hard case to progress because it's a multiple years and someone had to be very determined, the individual, Ms. Knox, had to be very determined, I guess, to see that to a conclusion. That's right. And um, sometimes um, when we focus on the individual cases, um, we're really talking about the one percenters. You know, the one percent scenarios, not, not everything goes to QCAT. Um, I don't have a um, hundred cases to talk to you about because a lot of them don't go to QCAT or they find other avenues or they, they resolve in a different way. Um, so um, you're right. So then the obvious question, I suppose, is how much merit should we place in one case? You're right. And and I think the reason why this case is of interest is because it, 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 it applies a piece of legislation, maybe typically more to workplace um, arenas is probably where we're more familiar of um, discrimination. Um, that is, now it's applying it to a body corporate and it makes a body corporate sit up and think, oh, wait a minute, um, I'm not, um, I'm actually exposed to this same piece of legislation. So um, I think that the, certainly different people in the industry have different views as to whether that was the right decision. 
Um, but for what it's worth at the moment, we've got a decision. Um, those laws apply to a body corporate. Um, the owner was successful in some respects. And so I think it at least gives cause to a committee to sit up and go, okay, we actually need to give some serious attention to this because um, it applies to us. As a body corporate manager, I occasionally get questions about people with you know, who want to make changes to their buildings, perhaps you know, to uh, accommodate them because they have a disability. I think a lot of the time, the information that might come back from body corporate managers might be something like, well, the body, you know, the building only has to stay within the code of the year in which it was built. There's no obligation for the body corporate to make any changes in this instance. Perhaps if you want to have, if you want to change something for your own purposes, you would be responsible for all of the costs of making that change, and the body corporate could agree on that basis. Probably not providing very much help to the people with disabilities, but that, I think that would be the standard standard kind of advice and information that might go out when these kind of questions are being asked. But you're so you're saying that's not really correct. The body corporates have to be more considerate, considerate to what's reasonable and then perhaps change their answer based on not just the needs of that disabled person, but also considering the, the wider community and what needs to change for the building as a whole, rather than just maintaining it within the building standards. That sort of practical advice, Will, I think... Um, I agree with it on a real practical level. Um, as a first response, um, I think it's quite sensible. You know, you, the, the first response to these things, um, it's not practical to to do the the, the expensive, long winded anti discrimination act and go into all the nitty gritty of what this legislation requires. Obviously, it was tested by Mr. Mrs. Knox. Um, and that resulted in a, one favourable outcome out of five. Um, but really, th there's a couple of options. Um, owners owners can make their own improvements to common property. So if they feel like there's a part of common property they aren't able to access or there's a difficulty, they could um, uh, ask a committee if it's within the thresholds or propose a motion to general meeting to make an improvement to common property, an improvement being a handrail or some other device that assists them around common property. Um, so that's one option. Um, and the other option is that obviously the body corporate could, the committee could propose a motion um, about making an improvement. But I think it's um, more broadly, it's not, um, it's not putting the blinkers on and going, that's your problem. I certainly don't advocate you know, spending an ordinary amount of money on a relatively simple request, but a committee should be aware that there is some risk if someone wants to push the issue um, that they might be required to make improvements to common property. So with all these things, I think a sensible approach, a practical approach um, and that's why the disability audit report can give a committee some objective information. If someone says, hey, I've got some problems with X, Y, and Z, and then the committee sort of have an audit report that maybe makes a comment about that area saying it's fine, or maybe the audit report does make some recommendations and they can go, okay, I can see what the owner is saying. Our independent person also agrees um, that something needs to be done. And then they could just make an informed decision on each case. Yeah, okay. So you're, really, you're not saying that body corporates have to sort of suddenly bring everything up to date uh, and, you know, change, change their whole buildings, but it's more about you have to accept that this is a process that you need to engage with and consider what changes you can make and make those decisions reasonably. I think that's right, Will. You know, obviously I wouldn't stop a body corporate if they really want to invest those funds and go through that, then that's good. But it can be somewhat reactionary because you don't know what the attribute is. It's hard to cater to every single person's needs because you don't know what the attribute is. Um, and then you don't know how that attribute will impact affect their ability to access common property. Um, obviously, a, a typical example might be someone in a wheelchair, but there's a broad range of attributes um, very different to um, wheelchair accessibility. So um, it's almost, if, if you went ahead and made some wholesale changes to your scheme and invested a lot of money, um, you might potentially have spent some money um, improperly because someone comes with maybe a different attribute than you contemplated, a different 
issue with how they access com property and your fix didn't doesn't quite help you they've just got to sort of double spend and do something a bit different so um you know i, I can't think of an example but maybe you um, remove the stairs in your pool and you make it more of a gradual beach entry um that's that might cost a lot of money to do those renovations but that maybe doesn't help someone who um can only access through a pool pool hoist. So you've potentially done a renovation that actually doesn't solve every scenario. So you almost do need to be a little bit reactionary, but I think what you can do to be proactive is, is get one of these reports. So at least your mind can be ticking with the kind of things um, that you should budget for. You need to deal with each one based on the request because uh, impairments and disabilities are very very specific to the individual. You've got the example up there of discrimination based on pregnancy. Body corporate might say, well, yes, you're pregnant today, but you're not going to be pregnant in, say, three months' time. How, how, do, you, how do you make a judgment on that kind of basis? Yeah, it's a good, good question. What the, the Anti-Discrimination Act is um, relatively strict um, in that it says even if the um, attribute sort of no longer exists, an example being pregnancy, um, at some point you won't be pregnant, um, then it can still constitute um, discrimination. Now, it, it's a little bit, um, how do you, you know, quantify um, any potential compensation? I expect it will be on the smaller end because that discrimination only existed for, say, nine months or whatever the temporary attribute was. Um, but um, yeah, the Anti-Discrimination Act would say um, it still is discrimination if it if it fits all those, um, if it fits all those definitions, um, but you're right, some of them can be very temporary, and um, it's just the nature of how the legislation works. Is it reasonable for a body corporate to say to someone, "Well, this is only affecting you, and so um, it's, we, we just, you know, we will make a change to the body corporate facilities to accommodate you, perhaps adding a handrail or something like that." but we believe that it should be paid by you as the person, as the only person who really wants this additional change to the common property. Yeah, I think um, the, the two approaches to that is sort of a legal approach and then a practical approach. Um, the, the legal approach would be that if it's um, an area of scheme land, not a lot, but area of common property um, or an area that the body corporate have control over, that um, if it fits the framework on the screen, it's you know an area, there's an attribute, it's indirect discrimination, um, then the body corporate would legally um, have the obligation as the controller of that con property to incur that cost um, and to do it. Um, now, I, I've, I need to speak somewhat generally because as you can see there's actually quite a, a process that needs to go through before you determine whether something's discriminatory or not i think it's very practical to have that approach of going well it's you you're the one that has this difficulty and so you should incur that cost but being aware that if that person sort of says no it's comp property and the body corporate has a responsibility then legally the answer it will sort of shift to the body corporate but I think as a very practical way of dealing with it, I think, and most most people would probably accept that as being a fair outcome, um, that they would incur that cost. So I think sometimes, particularly in this discrimination area, the, the law um, probably departs a bit from um, practicalities. Um, it's quite technical, um, this area. So um, I think any, any approach um, that, resolves it informally such as of asking that person to to foot the bill um oh, yeah i think it's very sensible okay so that's a reasonable first approach at least it may or may not solve the situation but if all parties are happy with it then that's that that's perfectly fine from the body corporate's perspective if you talked about costs in terms of like unjustifiable hardship yes in terms of the cost that other body corporate owners might bear now in the logs case the cost of installing the pool hoist was eight thousand dollars uh, I understand it's quite a large scheme. I think it's over a hundred dots. I'm not quite sure how many it is exactly. So the cost per owner was relatively small. Um, 
is, is there a point of, of what, what's unjustifiable hardship? If we had, say, an eight knot scheme and it required an $8,000 pool host to be put in, that's $1,000 each. So it's more of a hardship for everyone in, involved. Where, where does that cost number come in that we start considering something to be uh, unjustifiable? It is one of the factors um, that the um, tribunal will consider with unjustifiable hardship. Um, there is no golden number. Um, so whether it's, um, you know, $80 per person or $100 per person, um, there is no golden number. The, the tribunal will just um, will just have to weigh it up. So um, it, might be, it might be really inexpensive, but if the reason for imposing the term is... Um, is particularly important or it's really the only way that something can be done, and that will be another factor as to whether um, it's um, unjustifiable hardship. You're right. Um, I don't have an answer as to, um, you know, if the scheme only had eight owners and it was $1,000 each, but you could see how that would then start to sway a tribunal um, as to whether it was, um, it did impose a hardship. And, in, interestingly, the describing word is really important, unjustifiable. So it's not just hardship. It recognises that there might be some hardship. It's just unjustifiable hardship. Um, so the tribunal really has to juggle or balance the cost versus um, the reason for incurring the cost. Um, so, you know, case by case, but the more expensive it is, probably the more likely it is to constitute unjustifiable hardship. What would happen if the item, like a pool hoist, interfered with other owners' enjoyment of the pool? Um, I think you, I mean, you would have usual um, nuisance um, issues there. So nuisance would be the unreasonable interference with the peaceful enjoyment of someone else using common property. That would be a factor as to whether something is indirect discrimination. So I think it's a relevant factor um, to the person that asked that question. The tribunal does try to balance. Um, they're not solely focused on the one person with the impairment and making sure their needs are put above others. Um, it would probably come down to the extent to which it impacted the enjoyment. So if it sort of stops someone from using a whole metre of the pool or half a metre or a particular area, then um, that would sway against um, the body corporate being required to um, install it. So case by case, but I think um, it would probably depend on how much the pool hoist encroached the pool as to how much it might sway a tribunal. Our complex has a visitor's car park with three parks with disability parking signage. Recently, the committee and the building manager painted out two signs and converted two of the disability parking spots into three car spaces. My family members with disability permits struggle to find a park. What can we do? So I think my first thought on this is um, the development approval that applies to the scheme. Usually a development approval will um, require a minimum number of parks or particularly um, uh, PWD, dis disability parks. And so that um, would be the first thing to think about. Um, practically um, calling council um, because if we've if the scheme has reduced the amount of disability parks and if that that could be an infringement of the development approval and so council might have an interest in that so I think contacting council um, and then maybe other practical um, bits are having a look at the bylaws seeing um, whether you could submit a motion to the committee or a general meeting to add some more parks to improve common property um, they'd probably be the practical ways that I'd um, be trying to look at the problem. Yeah, reference to council's property or start point, isn't it? Uh, if it's a requirement that the scheme has a certain number of dis disability uh, parking spaces, you would hope that council might take action if they've been looking. My assistant animal is a 
who is approved by our local council to be registered as an assistant animal under the Disability Discrimination Act 1992. Uh, I've provided this information plus all the necessary affidavits and medical documents to the council. Can the body corporate still deny the assistant animal access to the strata community, continue to issue me with breach notices because I brought the animal to the strata community and demand that I provide them with all the medical documentation and information regarding approval under the Commonwealth Act, given that the council is the body who determines if the animal qualifies for registration as an assistant animal. So my, my thought on that is the Anti-Discrimination Act Queensland um, does not reference the Commonwealth Discrimination Act when talking about assistance animals or guide or hearing dogs. What the Queensland legislation does, it refers to the Queensland um, guide hearing assistant dog um, legislation. And so it would be that piece of legislation that would be relevant, not the Commonwealth um, legislation. So um, just because there has been um, an approval by the council or under the Commonwealth Act does not automatically mean that that animal um, can be brought into the scheme. If there are scheme bylaws that require um, approval um, for the keeping of an animal, those bylaws would need to be complied with. Um, the person could look at um, that animal, whether they apply to be an assistance animal under the Queensland um, guide dog legislation, um, but just because it's approved under the Commonwealth legislation, um, they would still need to follow the scheme bylaws um, before bringing that um, onto the um, bringing the animal onto the scheme. Okay, let's let's touch on animals in gen in more general uh, terms, though. Um, a lot of the time, body corporate managers we kind of get pressure from people saying they have to have their animal on site because it's an, you know these days they're called emotional assistance animals. Um, and there are a lot of disputes as a result. People obviously love their animals. They feel very, uh, very passionate about them. But what's the legal position of people saying, I need to have my pet and you have to respect it? So emotional support animals, there's, um, I won't bore everyone with the various definitions. It's sort of, you, you get switch to various pieces of legislation and various schedules. But if you follow all the definitions through, um, the assistance animal needs to meet the key definition under the um, Hearing and Assistance Queensland legislation, which is separate to the Anti-Discrimination Act. And there would usually need to be a condition, illness or disease or something like that, that requires the need for the animal. So first, you'd need to have some evidence of a condition, illness, disease or other impairment that requires emotional support animal and then if you do have that this emotional support animal would have to fit the definition of an assistance animal under the um the guide dog um queensland legislation um obviously you know you'd have to have a specific example in mind but you can probably see how there's a few hoops to jump through and my initial thought would be it would be in the in the true sense of an emotional support animal, probably quite difficult um, for that to satisfy that test, and you would need to have it as a usual animal entering a scheme and um, seeking approval under the bylaws. I I, I think it probably could um, fit into the assistance animal definition in some cases, but generally I think it would be quite difficult. Okay. What level of evidence is a body corporate required to ask around questions like this? There's no. Um, there's no list that I know of that we can point to um, of, you know, X, Y, and Z, but I think um, acting reasonably um, there, you, 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 if someone's requiring it for a particular need, well, can I have evidence of that need? Um, a, a GP medical certificate. Um, can I have um, ever a, a copy of its um, training certificate as a, as an assistance animal or as a, a guide dog or hearing dog. So I think, um, requesting those sort of surface level certificates um, is certainly um, within a body corporate's um, right to do so. Um, 
and, and quite a sensible thing. And I think sh it should be relatively freely given because if you're requesting an animal for a particular need, um, you should be um, sort of open to sort of proving up that need. Doesn't mean that you need to give the body corporate 40 pages of um, everything in your life, but some sort of certificate would um, would be sensible. Okay. And does that apply to other kind of issues with people with disabilities? If someone says, well, I need a wheelchair to access the site, and you're making an assessment about uh, whether to make changes, are you allowed to ask that person for medical certificates, other information to prove that they uh, actually require those changes to be made? Well, I think so. Um, and it's probably not so much. Um, I mean, we're allowed, body corporate and committee are allowed to really ask for anything. It's whether then the person's required to give it. And ultimately, the body corporate needs to act reasonable. So if, if they have a request given to them and they have no supporting material, there's no evidence of an impairment, no evidence of an inability to access. If there's no evidence of anything, then it'd probably be quite reasonable for the body corporate to not approve a request. So really it's, it's in the person's interest to actually give as much information as they can, because if the body corporate committee refuse the request, then that person's more likely to challenge um, that decision as being unreasonably made. So um, really the, the person has an interest to, to give as much information as possible. We've just had, Brendan, a couple of questions about the hierarchy of the legislation and whether we're Commonwealth and state legislation all. It's not so much that Queensland legislation trumps Commonwealth. It's the way the Anti-Discrimination Act defines um, defines assistance animals. Um, so it defines it. So in, for example, in New South Wales, it defines it by reference to the co some Commonwealth legislation. Um, the Anti-Discrimination Act Queensland defines it by reference to the Queensland um, Guide Guide Hearing and Assistance Animal Act, and so that will be the relevant piece of legislation. Um, also in the Body Corporate. Community Management Act, um, it defines um, uh, animals um, when it's talking about bylaws by reference to the Queensland piece of legislation. So it's really when we're talking about the Queensland Discrimination Act and the Queensland Body Corporate Act, um, that Queensland Guide, Guide Hearing Assistance um, Animal Act is the relevant act um, to go to not the Commonwealth. Committee meetings are held at our body corporate manager's office as we do not have uh, a meeting facility at the complex. There's very limited parking and very limited access for residents with supported disabilities and or mobility issues to enable them to exercise their rights to attend committee meetings. Some of those residents have recently asked that the committee meetings be held at a venue that caters for their needs. Venue hire fees would be incurred. We would appreciate your views on the body corporate's responsibilities and could anti-discrimination laws apply here? I think this is probably um, best approached by the, the start of the framework was, is the possible discrimination occurring in an area? And as it applies to a body corporate, the area would really be the common property, um, the common property of um, a body corporate. So if a meeting is being held off site, outside of the complex, then, and there's difficulty accessing that particular office for whatever reason, that's really outside the scheme land um, and not something that would fall um, within the purview of um, a body corporate's liability under the Anti Discrimination Act. Um, practically, um, you know, the committee could look at um, alternating um, where they hold meetings. Um, there could also be online access. So there's, there's ways that you could practically get around this, but legally, I don't think there'd be a liability for um, that offsite meeting because it's not really on the scheme land and not an area that um, the body corporate control. In the body corporate managers should probably be doing what they can to make that meeting accessible so they might not be able to change their building but certainly you can hold your meetings via zoom or other online applications these days that should be able to provide access to everybody uh, regardless of their you know physical capacity to attend so i know some people obviously like to attend in person but if it's not possible uh, online is a very good substitute so i would suggest that the body corporate should be trying to make sure that that facility is being offered okay thank you
Uh, we had another question. State federal housing entity owns lots in our body corporate complex. What options do we have if there's a request to change the common area of the complex to suit a tenant moving into a lot? The housing entity wants to change the common area to suit a specific tenant rather than select a suitable tenant for an existing common area. This could be an ongoing situation with every time there's a new tenant, a new request could be received. If the body corporate committee does not approve requests um, changing requests to change the common area, what's the next step? Um, seek legal advice, um, conciliation meetings. Look, I think getting some early advice is always beneficial because it will depend on what is the tenant's particular attribute, what's their particular need, what's the what is the request for? Is it to change something relatively simple? Is it to change something relatively major? Um, and because anti the, the discrimination act can apply, um, just because. Uh, prior to someone potentially moving in because they're proposing to move in and there's going to be proposed um, discrimination. So I think I think get some advice, talk to your body corporate manager first and if you feel like there's some advice needed because it really depends on what's, what's the person's needs and what is the change um, that's being required to be made. Because I, I completely understand and empathise where you you could potentially be getting tens and hundreds over the course of a building of all these little requests. And at some point, there needs to be some common sense um, to this. So, um, yeah, I think uh, try and understand what the request is, try and understand what the need is, and then get some early advice um, about whether there is um, some exposure um, under the legislation. You can't put your head in the sand about these kind of issues. You can't just say, oh, it's not a body corporate issue. You know, the building's built to code. You have to start considering these issues, but you have to consider them from a reasonable basis. And so you don't have to go too far in terms of making changes, but you have to consider what might be appropriate. And that's 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 very, very difficult to do because you're going to have to look at each individual case and, and making the fine judgments is is not going to be easy for many body corporates. Mm. Okay, all right. Well, we're coming up very quickly to the end of the session. So before we finish, we always like to uh, ask our presenters if they've got anything that they'd like to wrap the session up with. Any final thoughts? Brendan, I'll, I'll ask you first. I think that with ageing buildings and the high density living, I think the mix of occupiers is only going to cause these tensions and these um, issues to surface more often. And so I think it even just like a sinking fund forecast, having a think about getting someone to give a report on the common property and highlight some potential areas will will hopefully arm the committee when they are when a request is made, because a request at some point will be made to change something, um, they at least have a little bit of information from an independent person. Um, so that I'd be recommending um, engaging a report writer um, to assess the common property. Okay, and Will, thank you. Yeah, um, don't put your head in the sand. This is going to be a growing area, aging population. Uh, people are much more conscious of their individual rights. If you're uh, rejecting those out of hand, you're likely to find yourself in trouble. So always take that reasonable approach. Always look at means, uh, possible solutions uh, and keep your mind open. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.